Having looked at some of the basics of the features of the corporation and the corporate form and also uh, rights of stockholders and such, let's look at the uh, uh, some entries relating to uh, issuance of common stock. On February 1st, 2018, Billings Corporation was organized with 100,000 shares of $5 par common stock authorized. There's no entry to the accounts to record the authorization of shares, but there may be a memorandum entry, which is actually just a, a written uh, description or explanation of some critical event. It's generally going to be a result from a decision of the board of directors. Uh, we'll see some others of those, uh, well, even in this material here. Um, but there's no uh, debits and credits uh, to be recorded here for the authorization of shares. Well, then on February 12th, Billings issued 20,000 shares for $45, $45 in cash. Well, I should say $45 each. <laughs> so, uh, therefore, the, uh, well, the $900,000, 20,000 times $45 cash. Debit cash, $900,000 for the cash that's coming in. Notice we credit common stock account for the uh, par value, that $5 per share, $5 times 20000 gives us the $100,000 credited common stock. And paid in capital in excess of par uh, is credited for the difference there. That PIC excess of par is, a, is sort of a plug figure there. On February 26, 26, Billings issued 5,000 shares in exchange for land valued at $95,000, a building valued at $145,000, and Billings assumed a $20,000 mortgage payable on the building. The issuance of stock in exchange for property is recorded at the market value of the stock or the fair market value of the property, whichever is more clearly determinable. In this case, of course, we're uh, issuing stock for a non-cash asset. <laughs> when it comes to, when you've got cash involved, that, uh, that's pretty clear what the value of the stock would be, like in that first entry. But in this one here, it's not always easy to tell what the value of the land and buildings are. We don't trust appraisals very much, but sometimes it may be that the appraised or the best estimate of market value of the property, the non-cash property, land and buildings in this case, is actually more reliable than any value we might be able to, uh, to estimate or come up with for the stock itself. Uh, in this case, we're assuming that the property value is, is pretty accurate or we're, we're more reliant or let's say uh, we trust it more, uh, its reliability more than we do the value of uh, the stock. So we debit the land and buildings for their market values. Notice we've assumed this liability, so we have to record that as well. We uh, are issuing 5,000 shares of stock. Remember that par value of $5 per share. And so we're crediting common stock for $25,000, the $5 per share, times the 5,000 shares that we are giving up. And once again, we see paid in capital, excess of par is a plug figure there. Now here's just a few little odds and ends to, uh, to, uh, to address. How would these entries change if the stock had a stated value rather than a par value? Well, really stated value is just another way that some states use to refer to par value. I couldn't go into the history of that and explain why one state would uh, say something versus, uh, versus another. But anyway, just notice how these entries would only change in that wherever it said par in paid in capital excess of par, that would become a, a stated value. Um, that is, paid in capital in excess of stated value. And what if the same entries were made assuming we were dealing with no par common stock? Well, it actually makes the transaction a bit easier there because uh, you simply credit common stock for that recorded value of the stock. There's no paid in capital in excess of account. And so uh, that first entry where we issued uh, shares for $900,000 we would simply credit common stock for the $900,000. You know, companies can have different classes of stock. Um, in my experience, you're not going to see a company that has like par value stock and no par stock, although that's, I can imagine that could be possible. But you might have stock with different voting rights, like class A and class B. If you have different uh, classes of stock, you would actually have multiple common stock accounts. 
And so, whereas uh, we've used simply the account common stock, uh, for instance, back here in this transaction, if you had, if in fact this was issuance of common stock uh, class B, then the account itself would say common stock class B, something like that. So you would have a, a bit more descriptive term if you have multiple common stock accounts. A corporation's capital is usually divided into two broad categories. We've dealt with this for some time now. Paid in capital and retained earnings. Now paid in capital uh, is a pretty descriptive term. It's money that uh, investors have paid into uh, the corporation. And though the paid in capital accounts uh, consist of common stock and paid in capital in excess of par, sometimes you might see uh, instead of paid in capital in excess of par, you might see additional paid in capital. Or you might see premium on common stock. That's something I you used to see. I haven't seen that in quite a while. But uh, as we've seen before, there sometimes are multiple accounts uh, that uh, uh, that might you know be appropriate uh, in a given situation. And then we have earned capital or what we know better is retained earnings. This is uh, the, accumul the, the accumulated profits of the company. Yeah, remember that when a company generates a dollar of profit there are two and only two things they can do with that. They can distribute that those profits to the owners which we call dividends or they can retain those earnings in the company and of course that doesn't mean they're sitting on a pile of cash very quickly a company since cash is a low earning or non-earning asset companies will take those profits and they will uh, turn them into more inventory or they will buy equipment or they will pay off debts you know think of all the things you can do with with cash well we're really talking about cash uh, from profitable activities uh, keep in mind now that retained earnings does not represent cash. Uh, if you recall the discussion we had in class, you think in front of you, uh, you know, about on the left-hand side you've got assets, and then you've got to, to the right you have debts, and then on the far uh, right you have uh, common equity. Uh, cash is an asset. It's not, it's not equity, but it's a confusing thing for, uh, for a lot of people. Retained earnings is the, basically, uh, the sum of all the profits the company has generated since it began operation minus the sum of all the dividends it has declared uh, since it began operation. This uh, says, show the presentation of billing stockholders' equity after the above transactions, assuming retained earnings equals $32,000. If I were to do this on the board or in class, I would set up T accounts. <laughs> For common stock, for paid in capital in excess of par, uh, we're not really doing anything with retained earnings. We just need that to, to complete this section here, and that's why I gave you, in this example, that $32,000. But uh, hopefully you can go back and reconstruct these entries. Notice common stock, $5 par, 100,000 shares authorized, 25,000 shares issued and outstanding, total common stock account balance, 125000 That's, uh, as you'll recall, that... Uh, $100,000 that we issued, uh, that, that cash issue, and then the uh, $25,000 that related to the uh, uh, issuance in exchange for land and buildings net of that mortgage. Paid in capital in excess of par? Well, once again, if you look at those transactions that we, uh, that we uh, journalized, uh, post those to uh, T account for paid in capital in excess of par, you get 995000 So total shareholders equity or total shareholder equity, $1,152,000. I really want you to be thinking in terms of uh, the end product. You know, not just don't get in, uh, cheat yourself or shortchange yourself by getting just into the habit of making entries. You know, think in terms of putting this all together. You know, use of T accounts and then uh, of course, showing how this would be presented in the financial statements. Uh, really what you want to do is to be able to look at the financial statements and, and know where those numbers came from. Um, and not necessarily just to, to generate information, but to, to know uh, when you look at the statements what they tell you because, because you, know, uh, you know what transactions produce those, uh, those results. Dividends. Uh, in general, dividends are a distribution of profits to stockholders, something we just mentioned. And there are actually numerous forms of dividends, cash, property, and even additional stock uh, dividends. 
Now, the dividend decision is made by the corporation's board of directors based on a number of factors. By the way, a, a corporation generally is required to have a stockholders meeting annually, but it's required to have boards of four quarterly board of directors meetings. And at those boards of those meetings, of course, the, uh, the board discusses uh, high level uh, decisions and issues like, well, uh, acquiring another company, uh, paying dividends. That's actually a, an, an issue that comes up at basically every, uh, every uh, board meeting. And uh, decisions about borrowing money and so on. Like I said, high level decisions, changes in top management. Those decisions are made by the board of directors. Uh, we're going to start with cash dividends because it's the most common type and uh, uh, pretty easy to deal with. Now, to pay a cash dividend, the corporation must have sufficient cash within its assets and also sufficient retained earnings over on the uh, in the equity side. And I've already mentioned, you know, we want to make sure we know that those aren't the same thing. There are three key dates in the dividend in the dividend declaration process: uh, the date of declaration, the date of record, and the date of payment. Let's uh, demonstrate each of these through an example. Armenia Corporation has a million shares authorized and 200,000 shares issued and outstanding of its $5 stated value stock. I'm kind of sneaking some uh, twists and turns in here on you to get you used to those kind of things. On March 1, 2018, the Board of Directors of Armenia Corporation declares a dividend of 60 cents per share to all stockholders of record on March 17 to be paid on April 2nd. So notice here we've got the date of declaration, March 1st. We've got the date of record, uh, March 17, and we've got the date of payment, April 2nd. And what we're going to do is consider what happens on each of those dates. First of all, on the date of declaration, on this date, the corporation's board of directors votes to pay the dividend, and this act formally obligates the firm to pay the dividend. Notice that what happens is we debit retained earnings, and we credit cash dividends payable for 120,000, which is the 200,000 shares issued and outstanding. Well, really what's critical here is the number outstanding. Uh, dividends are paid only on shares outstanding. So that's where the 120,000 comes from. Uh, as we'll see again, well, later on when we deal with treasury stock, we'll see that a company may have more shares issued than are outstanding. Notice we credit cash dividends payable. It's a liability. On the date of record, that's when the corporation really decides who gets those shares. The date of record establishes the calendar date when the list of dividend recipients is made. Now, from the SEC website, this is I think you'll find this interesting. Once the company sets that record date, the date ex exchanges, the stock exchanges, or the National Association of Securities Dealers, that is basically NASDAQ, fixes the ex-dividend date. That's normally set for stocks two business days before the record date. That ex-dividend date uh, is when basically that stock begins to trade without the dividend. If you purchase the stock before its ex-dividend date, you get the dividend, if, as long as you don't sell it before, uh, uh, before that, uh, well after that, but before it goes ex-dividend. But once it goes ex-dividend, that is on that date, if you buy the stock, you don't get that dividend. And not surprisingly, you would generally see the stock's price drop from one day to the next by approximately that amount of the, amount of the dividend. The seller gets the dividend if you know if you sell it uh, well uh, if you buy it on the ex dividend date or after then whoever sold it to you uh, gets that dividend. Uh, there is no accounting entry on this particular date. That's really a, a mechanical function of figuring out who it is that gets the dividend. And then on the date of payment, on this date the company transfers funds to the transfer agent who actually prints the checks and mails them to the shareholders. Notice. Pretty straightforward, just debit cash dividends payable and credit cash on that date. So the transactions are not all that, uh, you know, all that heavy or involved, but uh, getting the dividend amount right can be important. Let's go to uh, the next video now for stock dividends.